Valley Focus is a public affairs presentation of Sandusky Radio, serving the greater Phoenix community and its surrounding areas. Now, Deborah LeRae. Good morning and welcome to Valley Focus. I'm your host, Deborah LeRae. Joining me in the studio for this segment, I have Dr. Lucy Chen with the Arizona Center for Cancer Care. Hi, Dr. Chen. Hello there. And I also have Carol Bafalugas. Yes. From Planned Parenthood. Yes. Good to have you here. Thank you. And I didn't even mess up your name. You didn't. You did a oh, great job. Good job. <laughs> great job. Way to go. Now, Dr. Chen, you're a radiation oncologist. That's correct. At the Arizona Center for Cancer Care. Mm -hmm. And Carol, you're with Planned Parenthood, right? Right. I'm the oh. associate medical director. And how long have you been with Planned Parenthood? 26 years. Holy moly. And I am a personal donor to Planned Parenthood. Been donating to Planned Parenthood since I was in my early 20s, which we won't do the math. <laughs> for the sake of math, we won't do it on this show. We thank you for your donation nonetheless. But you guys do great, great, great work for, for people who would normally not have access to care, and I applaud you for what you do. You. And Dr. Chen, how long have you been doing what you do? Oh, I've been a physician for 23 years now. So yeah, you're right up so there with the, the other two yeah, of us, right? Yeah, pretty close. Yeah, absolutely. <laughs> Not quite as many, but getting, yeah, getting there. Getting close, yeah. Well, January is Cervical Cancer Awareness Month, correct? Correct. So we're here to heighten awareness. Mm -hmm. And what exactly is cervical cancer? Cervical cancer is cancer that starts in a woman's cervix. The cervix is the lower part of the uterus that connects to the vagina. It's the birth canal. And uh, cervical cancer usually grows relatively slowly. And it starts with abnormal changes in the cells that is called dysplasia. Now, is there any way of preventing this or is it on the rise or what's going on? Well, there are ways to help prevent it. There's a vaccine that we can now use. HPV is the... That's the, the human papillomavirus. Human papillomavirus, exactly. Okay. The type 16 and 18 are the most common types that we see associated with cervical cancer, but there's a lot of different types of viruses. So we know that there are certain risk factors associated with cervical cancer. Women who start intercourse at a very young age, women who have multiple sexual partners, women who do not follow through with regular pap smears, and women who smoke. Those are the highest risk factors Is associated. there a certain age demographic? Well, usually women in their 30s are going to be diagnosed, and it can continue up until, you know, older women. But typically after a certain age, around your 60s, we don't see it as high of a prevalence. So it's mostly for younger women. It is, yes. It's affecting younger women yes. more often than yes. older women. Yes. Now, there was controversy around the HPV vaccine. Yes. Because, if I remember correctly, the recommended age to begin giving the vaccine was right around when a girl would begin her menstrual cycle, normally yeah. 12 to 13, 12 mm -hmm. to 14 years old. Correct. And there was controversy as to why you should do this to someone so young. You want to stress why it's important? Well, you want to give the vaccine before they become sexually active so that you can prevent the um, the virus from uh, growing more in these, these young girls. So if we do it too late, the vaccine may not be as effective. So it's best to get it before any sexual activity Correct. begins. Correct. Does it, uh, does it completely make you immune to it no or does it just lower your risk it definitely reduces your risk because it, it addresses the most prevalent types of human papillomavirus that we see associated with cervical cancer but there are quite a few different <coughs> types of human papillomaviruses how many types are there there's probably well over a hundred really yeah. mm -hmm. over a hundred yeah because i think when you when you hear hpv you think one right yeah, but that's not really So the it's case. really a misnomer. Yes, yes. Well, according to the American Cancer Society, there's going to be more than 12,000 new cases of cervical cancer diagnosed this year in this country alone. Mm -hmm. That's not including worldwide. 12,000 new cases. Right. Yeah, worldwide, we're talking probably close to 580,000 cases. And over half of them do die of cervical cancer because these are usually in developing countries where we do not have as good therapies, where we cannot detect the disease as early. Well... This makes it the third most common cancer form of in cancer world. in women. Yes, in the world it is the third most common cancer. Mm -hmm. Because you hear all about breast cancer, you hear about ovarian cancer right. when it comes to women. You hear, you're just starting to hear about cervical cancer in recent years with the 
uh, with the advent of the mm-hmm. the, uh, the the vaccine. vaccine. But prior to that, you very rarely heard about right. it. The, the incidence is not as high in our country because it is found more prevalently in developing countries where they don't have as good access to the pap smear and, and health care. Well, is this a slowly progressing disease? Yes, usually it is slowly progressing. And there's very few symptoms in the early stages? Yes, you can have some vaginal bleeding, especially after intercourse. You can have some pain. You can have some abnormal vaginal discharge. But yes, very often it does go undetected until it grows quite large. But those symptoms that you just that you just mentioned really are symptomatic of other things as well. That's right. That's why it makes it difficult. And we do stress that women should get regular exams. They should get their pelvic exams with pap smears. And now they can check for their HPV status. Now, you keep looking over at at Carol. I think Carol wants to jump in. You want to say something, Carol? No. I, I mean, <laughs> no. I agree with everything Dr. Chen has said, really. It's, uh, it's very prevalent. It's very asymptomatic. It is slow growing, thankfully, but that's why it's important that a woman gets her pap smear done. How often should you have your pap? It depends on your age, actually. I don't know if Carol wants to jump yeah. in. But. Um, we used to say start at 18. The guidelines have now changed to uh, starting your patch smear at age 21. Um, after the age of 30, depending on, you know, are you in a monogamous relationship, have all your paps been normal, you may be able to go every second or third year. But probably between the ages of 21 and you know, till you get to that point where you've had three normal paps, you should probably have them annually. So annually, not three years, five years, that kind of thing. Not Every year. You're, not until you're over 30, they've checked your HPV status and yeah, monogamous after, and normal pap smears. I think after age 30, if you've had your HPV status checked and you're negative and your pap smears are negative, you could go every five years even with the NCCN guidelines for screening. So it uh, it depends on As long age. as everything checks Correct, out. Correct, as long as everything checks out. But and really, you have no history. Right, right. So exactly. if, if let's say, for example, you get that phone call from the doctor's office uh you know uh, this is so-and-so's doctor's office we really need you to come in something was on your pap smear you get that dreaded phone call what and and let's say it is positive what do you do oh you definitely want to follow up with your doctors they're going to want to do another further evaluation they'll probably do what's called a colposcopy where they take a look at the cervix they may actually do special stains they they may progress and do actually some sampling of the tissue so it it just depends on what they're finding now i was reading that oftentimes hpv can go away on its own but not always And not always will it cause cervical cancer. So if you test positive for HPV, should you be alarmed? Or should you just be on on the safe side of caution, let's say, and just keep an eye, so to speak? We do have a test now that can tell us whether it's high risk HPV or low risk HPV. So if it's low risk HPV, we're not too worried about it. We're not worried that that's going to progress to a cervical cancer. If it's high risk HPV... Those are the ones that have been shown that over time, if you don't treat it, they could progress into a cervical cancer. And it it moves rather slowly, Mm -hmm. so it's a slow-moving cancer, so you could walk around literally for years and not even know. That's right. Right. And then all of a sudden... Right. There's, there's cervical neoplasia, which means the cells can look abnormal, and then there can be different levels of that. And then once it becomes true cancer, then it has different stages. So your symptoms could be abnormal bleeding, unusual heavy discharge, Mm -hmm. painful intercourse, pain pain during intercourse, painful urination, uh, bleeding after intercourse or Mm -hmm. between your periods or after a pelvic exam. So basically, if you're super sensitive, Mm -hmm. right? Mm -hmm. Oh, wow. Why should women be screened? Well, it... It's a curable cancer. I think we want to be able to detect it earlier and treat it appropriately. So what kind of screening is done? Usually the pap smear. Mm -hmm. If your pap smear is abnormal, pap smears are strictly a screening tool. So the more definitive thing to do is the procedure Dr. Chen talked about, which is a colposcopy, where they actually have a magnified, lighted view of the cervix. They can take biopsies. Those tissue samples are much more definitive. So they're going to tell us a little bit more about what's going on with that patient than but the But don't they smear. take uh, tissue samples when they do your pap? Cells. They take cells from the inside and the outside of the cervix. Okay. Whereas the biopsy, they're actually taking samples okay. of the cervix. Okay, so they're the actually taking a, por- a portion. Correct. Mm-hmm. All right. So 
HPV test looks for the types of the virus that causes most cases of cervical cancer, the high-risk types. Mm-hmm. Right. It can differentiate high-risk and low-risk. So risk. it'll know. Yeah. It'll say, oh, this is the high-risk mm-hmm. one. This will be, uh, this one's not too concerning. Mm-hmm. So how many years have we been trying to raise awareness that January is Cervical Cancer Awareness Month? Is this something new or is this just started recently or... Are we here because we're three ladies and we're concerned about our fellow women and we want us, we want everybody to be informed? That's, that's <laughs> right. right. <laughs> we care. <laughs> we care. That's why you're here today. Dr. Lucy Chen from the Arizona Center for Cancer Care. And I got Carol Bafalukas with Planned Parenthood of Arizona. And we're talking about January being Cervical Cancer Awareness Month. Now, Dr. Chen, I think that you said that women should... Uh, go every year mm-hmm. for their pap, ideally. Yeah, yeah. And starting at the age of 21. Now, if, for example, you don't have insurance, uh, Planned Parenthood has grant money through Title X to take care of those who need the service but don't have insurance to cover it. We do have uh, several Title X centers, and they will do the uh, pap smear, so the screening. If, in fact, the pap smear is abnormal, then we do refer for the further diagnostic of the colposcopy. You have uh, one of the Title X funded centers in Maryvale, Mesa, Yuma, and Tucson. Correct. Any any other places around the state, or are those the four? Those are the four for uh, the funded health centers. Okay. So there you don't have to worry about any kind of insurance at all. If you walk in and, and you say, you know, I need... Uh, it's based on family size and income, and then it would be a sliding fee scale. And, you know, that could slide to... No to zero, fee. to no mm-hmm. fee. So depending upon your income, about your personal in- income status, so and that of your family, if there's... X amount of numbers in the family, so it's it's means tested basically Correct. to make sure that you qualify to get free or low cost yes examinations and testing. So now you said that if if someone comes into one of the centers and and, and qualifies and it comes back positive, then you refer them to other places. Correct. There are uh, low cost services available for the colposcopy. Um, I was actually not asking Dr. Chen if there was any <laughs> uh, referral source within her organization for those that who we find have an abnormal pap that needs some treatment, because at that point we would be referring out. Right, and we, we actually um, just merged with a practice that uh, has a couple of uh, gynecological oncologists on staff, so we will be able to um, get those patients in for treatment. Yeah. So how do you kind of... I guess there really is no immunity to it because if it all depends on your personal sexual history pretty much, mm-hmm. right? Because this is not, it seems to me this is more about sexual history as opposed it is about your genetics. Correct. Like breast cancer, you may be in a higher risk because of your genetics. Mm-hmm. And this, you may be in a higher risk because of your past sexual activity. Mm-hmm. Because for all, for all intents and purposes, cervical cancer is an STD. Because almost 95% of cervical cancer is HPV. Right. Now, does it mimic other STDs? It could. I mean, there are other STDs that you may have that irregular bleeding, the Mm mid-cycle bleeding, you know, with intercourse or, you know, that it isn't associated with your period. And that, you know, could indicate chlamydia, that could indicate gonorrhea. But we usually try to screen those things out because those we can treat. Right. And cervical cancer can be treated if it's caught early, just like the detection is. Mm-hmm. It, it, as with all cancer, the earlier the detection, the better off you are. Correct. Yep. So basically, if you're put in a higher risk, if you have multiple partners. Mm-hmm. Uh, earlier onset of sexual activity, age-wise. Um, if you're a smoker and if you've got the HPV uh, you know, if you haven't had the vaccine and you have HPV positivity. Now, earlier when in our conversation, we were talking about how there was all that controversy surrounding the HPV mm-hmm. vaccine when it first came to, mm-hmm. to fruition. However, the, most of the controversy was because it was, it was pretty much being marketed to the perspective of get the girls young, get them before they begin their sexual activity to immunize them against maybe contracting Mm -hmm. HPV, correct? Mm -hmm. Now, 
if obviously someone who's in their 40s, this Mm -hmm. vaccine wasn't around back then. And same thing if you're in your 30s now, the vaccine wasn't available then. So what happens to someone who's in an older demographic? The vaccine doesn't help them. Yeah, there's no real. So if you're 45 to, years old, there's no point in going no, to get the HPV no, vaccine. No. So it's, really, this the it's for the young girls that will eventually become sexually active to help reduce that problem with HPV. Okay, yeah. and to help make them lower risk. Correct. And really, even if a, a a young woman maybe has already had intercourse, if they're under the age of 26, we still do recommend that they have the vaccine because maybe they weren't exposed to a high-risk HPV with that mm-hmm. particular partner. So we would still encourage them to get the vaccine, but the vaccine studies were only till right, age 26. 20, yeah. So 26 and under, we'll still give them the vaccine even if they've already had sex. Okay, so 26 and under, and when you say under, what is the... Nine. So nine years old, you can, you can vaccinate them. Yes. And I would imagine that really causes controversy when you it say does. Yes, it does. You know, it does. But you probably noticed this more than, than I have, Dr. Chen, because you, you see women on a daily basis as, as you do, Carol. But today it just seems, well, let me, let, me, let, me, let me digress for a second. When I was young, it seemed like, your your menstrual cycle kicked in when you were like 13, 14. Mm-hmm. It's much younger now. Yeah. Now I hear mm-hmm. of young girls at eight and, and nine years old mm-hmm. right, that are beginning that cycle. And is that why they recommend starting them at nine years old? Well, just we know sexual activity is happening younger. But nine? Well, not oh. probably not nine. <laughs> Let's hope um, not. But I have to say, I have an 11 year old daughter. She will be vaccinated this year. She's not happy with me because she hates shots, but... Hey, I don't um, blame you. I had a 13-year-old cousin that got (laughs) pregnant, so there, 13 years old. You know, that was probably a number of years ago, but still 13. So I can understand, but I can also see how some people's eyebrows may be raised when when you broach that subject and say... You know, mm-hmm. if I had a daughter, right. I would make sure she was vaccinated. How do you counteract someone's reticence about having their young daughter vaccinated at, say, 9 or 10? Well, you know, they worry that if uh, they're vaccinated or if they know about birth control that they're going to become promiscuous for some reason. But we have a vaccine here that can protect them from cervical cancer. I mean, this is a cancer vaccine. So you've got to kind of way. I'm not advocating for my 11-year-old daughter to be sexually active, obviously, but I want her to be protected so when she's older and she is sexually active, she may not contract Because, you know, it's inevitable. Inevitable. At some point. At some point, you know, know, hopefully not next year when (laughs) when she's 12. But, you know, hopefully, you know, I mean, I'm sorry, but inevitably she will become active eventually. Eventually. So if I can so protect be her protected. from a cancer, why wouldn't I? You know, and, and correct me if I'm wrong, because you're in oncology, Dr. Chen. This is really, truly the only cancer vaccine, correct? It is the the only cancer vaccine that we would use in this setting. There no, no, no. Yeah. I mean, as far as I know, and... There it's, are actually there are, two HPV vaccines. I don't mean just for HPV. Okay. I just mean cancer um, under the whole cancer there umbrella. There is a cancer vaccine for prostate cancer in the sense that it's it's actually it's a antibody based treatment for prostate cancer, but it's not a vaccine where we're we're preventing disease. I You're guess right. what I'm getting at is, wouldn't it be great that you know when you were before you headed off to grade school and when you got all your immunizations and your booster shots and all that stuff, that they could just give you a vaccine and say, hey, you know You're what? You're not going to get breast cancer. Yeah. You're not going to get, you know, any of these cancers. That's right. Yeah. You're not going to get thyroid cancer or pancreatic yes. or liver cancer right. or anything. That it would just be great that if it could, they could put that in with your, your MMRs, you know? Yeah. Right. <laughs> yeah, exactly. yeah. And, you know, some states have actually added this to the vaccines for children. You know, they've added it to the schedule. Yeah, for um, boys, boys and girls. For boys and girls, yes. Because it will work for boys as well, correct? correct? Well, correct. We, they're carriers. Right. We want to. We want to vaccinate the boys right. to protect the girls. Right. Correct. So because they're not going to end up with a, you know, obviously not going to end up with a cervical cancer, but they could. But they pass could it pass on it on to their partner. right because they could pass that virus on to an unsuspecting girl. Correct. And next thing you know, so basically, the boys mm-hmm. are carriers. Yes. Pretty much for yeah. lack mm-hmm. of a, a better definition. Mm-hmm. So if you vaccinate them like you just mentioned carol then girls can be protected correct especially if he turns out to be some sort of 
Casanova kind of guy, right? <laughs> <laughs> I got some special ladies in the studio with me this morning as we bring awareness to January is Cervical Cancer Awareness Month. Dr. Lucy Chen is here and Carol Bafalukas for Planned Parenthood. And Dr. Chen is a specialist in oncology and you've been doing this for 20 some odd years. Yeah. So you know your stuff. Well, I hope so. <laughs> By the time, I'm just yeah. Kinda, I'm just kind of following you guys, you know, going, well, you guys know what you're doing. So I'm just kind of throwing some stuff at you and see where it takes us today. Now, I guess the best way that we can prevent this entirely is to make sure that all young women are vaccinated, all young boys are vaccinated, and we basically get our PAPs every year. That's or a great step. recommended. Yes. Mm -hmm. right. Limit the amount of sexual partners mm -hmm. that you have. Mm -hmm. And try to delay you, initiation of sexual activity until, you know, a little bit older. You know, so if at all so possible. Yes, yeah. if at the all possible. Cervix, the epithelium of the cervix in a young woman is very receptive to the HPV, and it's more exposed. So... If she has sex at 14, she may be more receptive to the HPV than if she were 21 or mm -hmm. 22. I see. So, so there's a physiological reason that it's best to wait till you're older to have intercourse. Or make sure that you have your, your vaccine. Correct. Mm -hmm. And that way there you're less susceptible. Or at least you're, you have a layer of protection, right, so to right, speak. Right. Because... Uh, even, even though we can preach till the cows come home that you have to practice safe sex or you have to practice abstinence or whatever the, mm -hmm. whatever the flavor of the day may be, the bottom line is that curiosity will always be there. Sexuality is always going to be there. You're always going to have people who are experimenting or trying or attempting to try. So why not at least protect them or at least give mm -hmm. them the best amount of protection that you can? Correct. So that's what it's all about. We want to make sure that all girls get their HPV vaccine from ages 9 to 26. Even if you've already had sex, it's okay to go get your vaccine. Correct. Provided you haven't had like 300 partners by the Correct. time you're 26. Yeah. That would defeat that would the be, purpose. Yeah. We don't ask, I assure yeah. you. Yeah. <laughs> that's, that's a good thing. I don't think we want to ask how many partners. That's not part of the screening process? You don't we don't ask if they've had 300 partners. <laughs> okay. Because, <laughs> wow, I'm just wondering, that would be incredible at the age of 26 if that was the case. But I don't think we have to worry about that. Are there new advances in cervical cancer research going on, Dr. Chen? Ooh, well, the research, um, you know, there's always new research in terms, from my perspective, therapies. So there's chemotherapy, there's radiation therapy and surgery. So there's always new studies ongoing for what the best treatment is for cervical cancer. Are there researchers that are working on different ways to prevent, diagnose, treat? Yeah, yeah. I mean, I, I'm more on the treatment end of things. So I see patients when they come in with a diagnosis. And so we're always trying to optimize their survival and minimize long-term toxicities. So because the three methods for treatment for cervical cancer include surgery, sometimes chemotherapy and radiation, depending on their stage, there's all sorts of potential toxicities associated with that. And because these are younger women, there's the issue of fertility. There's the issue of long-term complications to the bowel and the bladder. And chemotherapy can also, um, you know, cause certain long-term toxicities. So we all want to minimize those. It, it, this, this is what blows my mind, because it doesn't matter if I have breast cancer in here, if I have ovarian cancer in here, if I have prostate cancer in here, no matter what we're in here to talk about. It just seems that the, the, the one treatment that just seems to be universal across the board is chemotherapy. And it just blows my mind because we've heard about cancers now for, what, 100 years mm, yeah, at least? At least. And in the 100 years of research and all of the money that has been thrown at different types of cancer and different types of cancer research to this day chemotherapy and radiation still seem to be mm. the two 
treatments that are used the most. And I guess what I'm trying to say is, in 100 years, we haven't come up with anything better than that? With all of the money that's been thrown at research? It just well, there there are away. more and more what we call personalized medicines. So there's a lot more antibody-based therapies. So that can minimize toxicity because we're actually taking an antibody and using that to treat cancer. But it's not been a cure-all. So essentially, for any cancer patient, we do need surgery because we need to have tissue diagnosis to make sure they actually have the correct diagnosis. The radiation is used in about 50% of cases because of the type of cancer they have. So it depends on what your diagnosis and your stage is. Radiation may play a role. Radiation's been used since about 1896. And so we have well over 100 years of experience with using radiation. And chemotherapy basically started around World War II after we had some nitrogen mustard and, and you know, we were able to fine tune a lot more of the drugs. But these days in chemotherapy, we're looking at molecular based therapies. So it is moving but not as fast of a pace as we'd all like to see I, I can i can definitely say that definitely not as fast as we would all like to see it have yes. moved over the last hundred and some odd years mm-hmm. or so because it just i don't know i that that to me is the one thing that just knocks me down with a, you could knock me out with a feather with when it comes to cancer everybody's chemo and radiation and it's like come on really well, it has changed a lot. The chemotherapy regimens have changed dramatically. Not from what I hear or not from what I see somebody blogging. Well, actually, yeah, because 20 years ago for breast cancer, we used to give a year's worth of various types of chemotherapies. Then that got changed to about six months. And now we're down to usually three to four months of chemotherapy and various different types of chemotherapies that work better. Um, Radiation has definitely changed dramatically over the last 25 years. We now have very precise ways of delivering it. Instead of doing a two-dimensional plan, we do a sometimes four-dimensional plan with respiratory gating and we have very tight margins for brain tumors we have very very tight margins and we're giving three to five treatments instead of 15 treatments for certain types of things so yeah it definitely has dramatically changed but maybe not so much to the average person who still has to hear that yes you need chemotherapy and yes you need radiation it it can be very scary yeah you you hear yes you need chemotherapy yes you hear radiation yes you're going to be nauseous yes you're going to lose your hair Yes, you're gonna, your eyebrows are going to fall off and you're not going to have any eyelashes and you're going to feel like crap and your skin's going to turn yellow and yeah. Yeah, it's, it's a lot better than it used to be though because we now have much better categories of patients where they don't need chemotherapy or they don't need radiation. So it's not um, kind of a everybody gets the same treatment type of thing. It's much more individualized based on stage and histology, the type of cancer. For example, in cervix cancer, we've got about half of the cases being squamous cell and then there's adenocarcinoma and then there's a whole bunch of smaller, small cell, very, very unique different types of um, cervix cancer that that are not commonly seen, but we still treat them um, based upon you know the best knowledge that we have. We have a couple of websites that you can visit. You can go to ppaz.org. That's for Planned Parenthood of Arizona, ppaz.org, and for Dr. Chen's excuse me, Dr. Chen's website, it's canceraz.com. So canceraz.com, PPAZ for Planned Parenthood, PPAZ.org, canceraz.com. Do you guys have any, is there anything that we forgot to mention or anything more that we should throw in and and maybe expound on a little bit more? No, uh, women just need to keep up with their gynecological exams just to make sure that if there is anything brewing in there, we pick it up as early as possible. And the earlier, the better, right? Right, right. Yeah, please see your health care providers and get your regular screening and mammograms and pelvic exams. and Every year. Every year. <laughs> Best of health to everybody. <laughs> every year. I, it yes. is the most unpleasant thing on the planet. But every year we subject ourselves to it. Why? Because we want to stay healthy and That's we want right. to make sure. But uh, I guess, Carol, that you are, are a testament to the HPV vaccine. If you're going to have your own daughter do it at the age of 11 when she turns 11. But you can do, if you have a daughter, you can start her, get her vaccinated at the age of 9 all the way up until 26. Correct. And for anyone over 26, just make sure you're protected. Have safe sex, use your head, 
try not to try not to compete with Will Chamberlain and have hundreds of partners, <laughs> you know, or, or or some rock stars that are out there, and just use your head about it, and and just you know, and if you have boys, boys, I have two boys, they'll be vaccinated as well. Let's make sure the boys get vaccinated right. too, because they're the carriers that can give the HPV virus, mm -hmm. the human papilloma virus, to girls. So. Can I also add the um, HPV vaccine not only protects from the two most common cervical cancer strains of the HPV, but it also has uh, HPV 6 and 11, and those are two of the most common that will cause external warts. So it could protect a male from the external warts that would need to be treated and could potentially be passed on to a partner. So it actually has four different strains of the HPV that is protecting against. And it's, that's an even better reason to get everyone vaccinated between the ages of 9 and 26, Correct. boys and girls alike. Mm -hmm. And if you need to find out more about Planned Parenthood Arizona, you can go to ppaz.org because there's Title 10 funding at four clinics in here in the state of Arizona. Mesa, Yuma, Maryvale, and Tucson, I believe. Tucson. Mm -hmm. And if you want to find out what Dr. Chen does, you can go to CancerAZ.com. All right. Thanks. I think we got it all, yeah. didn't we? Yeah. You ladies are amazing. Thank you so much. Thank you. Well, thank you. For stopping by.